recording. Go ahead. It's June 14th, Dr. Kurtz. Okay, everybody. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, some unusual acid base cases. You could get these uh, on your board exams. Uh, we have a number of cases to get through, so hopefully we can get through all of them today. They're, they're, they're very interesting from a clinical point of view also, not just from the, from the acid base point of view. So the first case is a 55-year-old woman uh, with uh, diabetes and obesity uh, who had an infected knee prosthesis. And in hospital, she received Norco for pain relief. Uh, about 107 grams of Tylenol over a six week period. And then weeks later in hospital, her condition worsened. She had a little bit of vomiting and uh, these were her numbers. Um, so of note, her total CO2 uh, on the chemistry panel was 10, bicarbonate nine calculated on the blood gases. And you can see her numbers here. She had a pH of 7.44, a pCO2 of 14, and uh, a bicarbonate of nine. Her lactate was a little bit elevated. So the first question is, what is the acid base diagnosis? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? You can unmute yourself and don't be shy because the, the thing is here to go through the thinking and come up with the acid base diagnosis and then we'll go into what the clinical diagnosis was. Anybody feel comfortable taking a stab at that? You're gonna to have to do it on your boards. Might as well try. Nobody? Hi, Dr. Dr. Kurtz, this is Aus. I don't yeah, know if you hear me. It's a little bit, little I bit can hear you. I can hear you. So we have alkalemia on, on pH with an ion gap metabolic acidosis, lactic acidosis. Right, so what's the anion gap? Uh, 32. Okay, so the anion gap's elevated, correct. Uh, Possibly with the respiratory compensation. With right. So, so, so the, the first thing to do, the first thing to do again when you get these numbers is focus on the bicarbonate and ask yourself, is the bicarbonate elevated, normal, or decreased? This is for any patient. Decreased, definitely. So if it's decreased, you have three possibilities. It's either a metabolic acidosis or it's acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis. Um, and each of those has a different change in the PCO2 for the change in bicarbonate from normality. Now here you have another clue, as you mentioned, you have the anion gap elevated. So that would suggest you're dealing with a metabolic acidosis as a cause for the low bicarbonate and not a respiratory alkalosis. Now acute respiratory alkalosis um, cannot be, you can't, even if your PCO2 went to zero acutely, your bicarbonate wouldn't fall uh, by, six, by 16. So you're either dealing with chronic respiratory alkalosis or metabolic acidosis. With the anion gap elevated, it suggests a metabolic acidosis. The anion gap, as you mentioned, is 32, which is uh, about 20, 20 higher than it should be. Now remember, the bicarbonate in the ideal world falls by whatever the anion gap went up. So if the anion gap went up by 20, the bicarbonate should have fallen by 20. And so if the bicarbonate fell by 20, it means it was above 25. So this isn't just uh, a simple metabolic acidosis, because remember, you always have to add the change in the anion gap to the current bicarbonate to get what the bicarbonate theoretically was prior to this um, uh, anion gap acidosis. So it turns out that this patient not only has a metabolic acidosis of the anion gap type, but also a metabolic alkalosis, because when you add the anion gap change to the current bicarbonate, you get 20, 29 or 30, you don't get 25. Um, the other thing is, what's the compensation? Remember, the compensation is about one to one. Whatever the bicarbonate fell, the PCO2 should fall. But the PCO2 here fell much more than the bicarbonate fell. So this isn't just a compensation. This isn't just appropriately compensated. If it was appropriately compensated, the bicarbonate, the PCO2 would have also fallen by 16. And it should be, you know, 40 minus 16, which is 24, not 14. So the patient, in addition to having an anion gap metabolic acidosis and a metabolic alkalosis, which you know from having added the change in anion gap to the current bicarbonate, also has a respiratory alkalosis. So there's three acid-base uh, disorders here. 
Okay, so the acetaminophen was uh, stopped uh, and the acidemia slowly corrected. So anyone want to take a stab at what the clinical diagnosis is here? Why did the patient develop an anion gap metabolic acidosis? Anybody? Okay, well, uh, they measured the 5-oxyproline level. It's also called pyroglutamic acid, and it was very high, 10.5. And the diagnosis of 5 oxo uh, proline, prolinemia was made. Now, this was first described in 1989 by Creer, and you have the reference there. And I'll give you these slides afterwards if you want. They reported a 52-year-old woman with an anion gap metabolic acidosis caused by a systemic accumulation of 5-oxyproline. She also had it in her urine. Uh, they hypothesized that she had developed an acquired form of this, which had been described before with some inborn errors of metabolism. A drug screen was positive for acetaminophen, but the authors didn't comment on the relationship between acetaminophen uh, and the disorder. And the, but they did note that the biochemical abnormalities gradually resolved with IV fluids, bicarbonate, and stopping the acetaminophen. But they didn't make the connection with acetaminophen. Uh, now it's felt to be due to Tylenol. And this complicated slide here, it, it takes a little while to look at, so I won't uh, dwell on it too long. You can look at it afterwards. But basically, the mechanism is felt to be in the um, enzymatic systems that create glutathione. And glutathione is made from glutamic acid, cysteine, and glycine, three different amino acids. And there's enzymes that uh, are involved. And what happens is, if, uh, your if you go to the bottom panel, if your um, glutathione is deficient, then that will stimulate the first reaction here that takes glutamic acid uh, and adds a cysteine to it. But the reaction can't continue to make glutathione because if there's no cysteine around, it inhibits the second step. It ends up that you start making 5-oxyproline uh, in, in the first reaction from uh, glutamyl, uh, gamma glutamyl phosphate. Uh, and that's the source of the 5-oxyproline. Now, why is glutathione and cysteine uh, deficient? That occurs when you take a lot of Tylenol. You get glutathione deficient and you become cysteine deficient. Tylenol increases the excretion of uh, uh, sulfur-containing amino acids in the urine. That's one hypothesis. There's a second hypothesis. So there's some disagreement as to the mechanism. Again, complicated, but here it's felt to be in the second part of the uh, reaction where you add a glyce, the last amino acid glycine to make glutathione. There's an enzyme called glutathione synthetase, and that is felt to be inhibited by this compound called NAPQI. NAPQI is a metabolite of Tylenol that increases in the urine, and but that is a very reactive compound and stops the uh, this this enzyme uh, causing the reaction to go to favoring 5-oxyproline production. And 5-oxyproline uh, is, is an organic acid. That's what causes the metabolic acidosis. Um, it's also called pyroglutamic acid. So the frequency is unknown. It's rare. It's felt to occur with long-term acetaminophen use. The large majority of patients that have been reported are women, and they have other medical diseases. It resolves when you stop the Tylenol. Some people have given N-acetylcysteine um, which may accelerate the recovery by increasing cysteine. And remember when there's more cysteine there, you don't get that first reaction occurring to the same extent, although it's not proven. Um, there is a rodent model where if you add acetaminophen to their drinking water, they can develop this. You can also give methionine, uh, which also can help prevent the disorder by providing um, cysteine to the system. Uh, it's metabolized, can be metabolized to cysteine. Um, and it's felt that it's largely converted to a number of sulfur containing amino acids, including cysteine, which are again depleted uh, because of their increased renal excretion by acetaminophen. So just remember that acetamin can cause an, uh, an anion gap type metabolic acidosis. And this could be on your exam because there's a number of papers in the literature now uh, with this. Although the mechanism is still argued. Uh, empirically, it does cause 
um, with prolonged use, um, an organic acid induced metabolic acidosis. So remember this one. Okay, here's another patient, 66 year old female diabetic with obesity, and she developed new onset edema and weight gain, some fatigue, chronic, you know, complicated patient, chronic hypertension, hypothyroid. Uh, and these are her numbers. She was severely hypokalemic, uh, marked elevation in her total CO2 on the chem panel to 50 and her calculated bicarbonate of 49. Uh, PCO2 is elevated. Uh, they did some uh, other tests measuring the sodium chloride and potassium excretion. They were all roughly what was expected for her dietary intake. Uh, and she also had, interestingly, um, marked proteinuria uh, with an albumin that was slightly low. So what is the acid-based diagnosis? Well, again, focus on the bicarbonate. Don't look at anything else. Don't look at the pH. Don't look at the PCO2. The bicarbonate's elevated. So again, you have three possibilities. It's either a metabolic alkalosis or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. Again, each of those has a different change in bicarbonate for change in PCO2. Um, hypokalemia tends to occur with metabolic alkalosis. So that's a clue like the first case with the anion gap. You don't get hypokalemia in acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. So the fact that there's hypokalemia there, you're already thinking metabolic alkalosis. Um, Okay, so anyway, the bicarbonate um, is increased. Let's say it's 25 to begin with. We don't know for sure. It's up by about 24. Um, if it's metabolic alkalosis, we'd expect the PC, PCO2 to go up seven tenths of that, right? That's the com compensation. It's seven tenths of whatever, or 0.7 times whatever the bicarbonate went up. And clearly it, it hardly went up. It went up by 11, which is a lot less than you would predict. Seven tenths of 24 is not 11. Um, so if the patient has a metabolic alkalosis, the patient also has a respiratory alkalosis. And the reason there's a respiratory alkalosis diagnosed is because the PCO2 did not go up as much as you would expect, uh, for the compensatory response. The compensatory response becomes your new normal. Everything below that is respiratory alkalosis. So the patient has a metabolic alkalosis. We don't divide it up by anion gap. We divide it up by whether there's chloride in the urine or there's not. If there's no chloride, we then predict that the patient will respond to chloride therapeutically. If there's chloride in the urine, you can give them as much chloride as you want. Nothing's gonna to happen to their bicarbonate. And here the patient's excreting you know, chloride, which you'd predict from the dietary intake. Certainly this isn't you know, a low chloride in the urine. And so this would be a chloride insensitive uh, metabolic alkalosis. There's no reason to um, give chloride to try to make the bicarbonate come down. Okay, and the next question, the next uh, bit of evidence, other tests were done. The renin was low, was 0.4. The aldo was normal, but remember the patient's severely hypokalemic and you'd expect the aldo to be low. Remember hypokalemia suppresses aldo production. So the presence of a normal aldo with hypokalemia means there's a high aldo. If that K was normalized, that aldo would go up a lot. So the fact that you have a normal aldo with a low K means that you're hyper aldo. And the cortisol level was very high. Uh, it was noted the patient had an enlarged liver with multiple nodules. There uh, was a needle biopsy done which showed uh, neoplasm with small cells. And you can see the histology. And the immunocytochemistry confirmed uh, neuroendocrine differentiation uh, with uh, positivity for chromogranin A uh, and synaptophysin besides some cytokeratins. And it looked like lung CA, undifferentiated neuroendocrine. Um, this type of case was first described in the Lancet. Um, they then measured the ACTH level and it was 61. Very high. Does anyone want to make a stab at what the clinical diagnosis is? So small this small lung cell. Yeah, small lung cell CA in the liver with a high AC ACTH level and a severe metabolic alkalosis. So this patient had a diagnosis of ectopic ACTH syndrome called EAS, 
and was treated with chemo, ketoconazole, then some dexamethasone when the cortisol uh, came close down closer to normal. Remember that ketoconazole inhibits 11 beta hydroxylase and 1720 lyase, which are enzymes that are key when you, when you uh, look it up in cortisol production in the adrenal gland. So when you inhibit those, you can inhibit cortisol production pretty nicely. But remember that you get the metabolic alkalosis without aldo being high here. And that's because cortisol can stimulate the mineralocorticoid receptor in the cortical collecting duct. Now, normally there's an enzyme in the cortical collecting duct cells called 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which takes cortisol and converts it to cortisone. And cortisone does not bind to the mineralocorticoid receptor. And that prevents cortisol in your blood from causing a metabolic alkalosis all the time. It doesn't, cortisol doesn't regulate salt transport in the cortical collecting duct because it never is allowed to get high enough to bind sufficiently to the mineralocorticoid receptor. However, if cortisol is extremely high, the enzyme can't keep up. So that's one scenario like this patient. And then there are other instances, such as if you're on a lot of licorice, which can block 11-beta-hydroxysteroid. And now again, you have too much cortisol and it can also stimulate the mineralocorticoid receptor. And uh, in AME, apparent mineralocorticoid excess syndrome, uh, you have a mutation in this enzyme and it doesn't work. And again, you have too much cortisol compared to cortisone. So you can always tell because you measure the ratio of cortisol to cortisone in the urine and the cortisone level should be like three, it should be like 0.3 cortisol to cortisone, much more cortisone. But in the presence of licorice or AME, you have very little cortisone, much more cortisol and you'll see that ratio, you know, it can be one or two or three, whatever. And you know that there's a problem with the 11, 11 beta hydroxysteroid. And this um, dehydrogenase, in this particular patient, there's no problem with the enzyme. It's just there's way too much cortisol for the enzyme to convert it all to cortisone. And so you end up with the same problem. You end up driving that mineralocorticoid receptor, uh, which leads to a whole series of transport changes that um, generate the metabolic alkalosis. Now the proteinuria is interesting and it's not well recognized that in Cushing syndrome, 80% of patients have proteinuria. It's something most people, most doctors don't know, uh, but it's true. And so um, it's not due to a glomerular lesion. It's felt to be due to hyperfiltration. And uh, if you can resolve the Cushing syndrome, the proteinuria is reversible. And that's what happened in this patient. And that's, you know, four grams of proteinuria resolving after just, uh, getting that cortisol down to normal is pretty, pretty impressive. So in this patient, the proteinuria resolved also with treatment. Okay, here's another patient, 69-year-old woman with cramping, weakness, and fatigue. And the past six months, she was admitted three times with hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and a metabolic alkalosis. Treated with salt tablets, potassium, IV fluids, with some, some improvement. She came in um, hypotent, mildly hypotensive with no edema. She was, uh, had hyponatremia, mild hypokalemia, um, and again, bicarbonate elevated. We don't know the original bicarbonate. In a woman, it's usually about 23. So this bicarbonate's up, you know, by about, by about 14. Uh, again, the PCO2 should be up as a compensation by seven tenths of that. So seven tenths of um, of 14, it's a, it's a little low, the lower than expected for the compensation. Um, the urine sodium and chloride, this time, unlike the previous patient, were, were low. Um, and, and so this would tell you that uh, this, is a, this is a chloride sensitive metabolic alkalosis. If you give chloride, this bicarbonate should return to normal. So as far as the acid-based diagnosis, the patient had a metabolic alkalosis uh, and, and, and a respiratory acid. I'm sorry, the, the, the PCO2 is a bit higher than you would expect. Um, so as far as the pathophysiology of the metabolic alkalosis, whenever we have it, we ha you always think of two things. Uh, one, you have to always account for why the bicarbonate concentration increased acutely, which is called the generation phase. Uh, and you also have to always account for why isn't the kidney getting rid of it? If I give you bicarbonate now, your kidney will just pee it out. Why is the kidney not peeing out the bicarbonate is the second question you must always answer. 
So as far as why the bicarbonate concentration increased acutely, which we call the generation phase, there's really only two possibilities. One is that the bicarbonate concentration increased without more bicarbonate added to the body because of a loss of water around a fixed amount of bicarbonate. So it's like you're just increasing its concentration. You're not adding more bicarbonate to the body. You're just, you have the same amount of bicarbonate, but you have much less water. And so the concentration goes up. That's one possibility. The second possibility is that bicarbonate was added to the body, added to the blood. And that's usually coming from either the stomach or the colon. Those are the two main sources of non-MD administered bicarbonate. Obviously we can give it IV, but if it's from organs, it's usually the stom stomach or the colon, which is adding the bicarbonate to the body. And typically if it's the stomach or colon, it's associated with chloride loss from the body with equimolar bicarbonate gains, such as transport on a chloride bicarbonate exchanger where chloride is driven out into either the lumen of the colon or um, the stomach in exchange for uh, bicarbonate. And this doesn't have to be one transporter. This can be in a net sense on a number of transporters. You lose chloride in exchange for bi bicarbonate. And that's why also there's little chloride in the urine. You've lost chloride from the body, so your urine chloride goes very low. Why the kidney doesn't excrete bicarbonate usually is three possibilities. One, you have a low GFR, right? You're typically volume depleted with pre-renal failure. So your GFR drops and that's gonna prevent you from getting rid of bicarbonate because the filtered load of bicarbonate is less. There's less bicarbonate per unit time coming into the proximal tubules because your GFR dropped. The second reason is that your proximal tubule is hyper absorbing bicarbonate. Uh, usually because of angiotensin II going up during volume depletion, which changes the transport of a number of different transporters, which you won't go into, in the proximal tubule that reclaim bicarbonate, they're functioning at a higher rate. And so your proximal tubule um, more efficiently absorbs any bicarbonate coming through the glomerulus. And then the third reason is in the cortical collecting duct, where a, a protein called pendrin, which normally secretes bicarbonate, into your urine works less well in the absence of chloride in, in the lumen. So the low urine chloride isn't just of diagnostic importance to tell you whether it's chloride sensitive. The low urine chloride has physiologic importance in that it contributes to the maintenance phase by preventing pendrin from working. It prevents pendrin from secreting uh, bicarbonate into the uh, lumen in exchange for chloride. So for those three reasons, um, the kidney holds on to bicarbonate more efficiently uh, and doesn't get rid of the bicarbonate in the blood, even though it's much higher than normal. Well, the patient acknowledged that she had frequent mucinous bowel movements. Her stool was measured. She had a sodium of 86. You can see it's a bit higher than normal. K was a little lower than normal. And she had much more chloride in the stool than is normally there. Her osmolality was 300, which is a bit above normal. And she had a stool osmolar gap that was measured of 42. The normal is 50 to 100, so it's a bit low. And the way you look at the stool osmolar gap is if it's under 50, you have much more sodium and potassium or what's called electrolytes than you should normally have. And that's compatible with a secretory diarrhea. Because the way you calculate the osmolar gap is you take 300 minus two times the sodium plus potassium, and you should get 50 to 100. If you have less than 50, then you know there's much more sodium and or potassium than there should be causing that difference to be smaller. And that's what you see with an electrolyte diarrhea. As opposed to a substrate induced diarrhea or also what's called an osmotic uh, diarrhea, such as laxatives, where the osmotic gap is, is greater than 100 often. Um, you have much less sodium and potassium there. So this patient uh, had a secretory diarrhea. The, the, the osmolar gap was under 50, it was 42. So there's some reason for increased sodium potassium in this patient's, uh, in this patient's stool. Uh, on colonoscopy, she had a mass in the rectum. So the question is, what is the clinical diagnosis? Does anybody wanna take a stab at it? Metabolic alkalosis, hypokalemia with a mass in the rectum with a chloride sensitive metabolic alkalosis. Say again, sorry. 
Oh, I thought someone said something. Okay, well, the diagnosis here is a villous adenoma. It was resected and she had an end colostomy. And uh, this is just a picture from a, another article. Um, uh, it was actually first published in the 50s, the reference is there. Uh, after surgery, after taking it out, there was prompt resolution of her symptoms and electrolyte abnormalities. But you should be aware that most of these secretory villous adenomas of the colon cause a non-gap metabolic acidosis because they produce large volumes of potassium and bicarbonate rich fluid. You do not get a chloride sensitive metabolic alkalosis most of the time. So that's rarer in 10 to 20% of patients who secrete where the tumor secretes chloride um, preferentially rather than bicarbonate and they get a metabolic alkalosis. Um, so this, this patient was in the 10 to 20% group. It can cause both. Okay, another case, this is a 40 year old woman with a one day history of abdominal pain and vomiting. And on exam, she had a slight fever with bilateral loin tenderness. Blood pressure was down a little bit, no edema. And uh, total CO2 of nine, bicarbonate calculated of eight. Uh, she had renal insufficiency and her white can was elevated. Again, we look at the bicarbonate. We don't look at anything else. Is it down, normal or elevated? Well, it's down. So we're either dealing with a metabolic acidosis or acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis. Again, acute respiratory alkalosis, even if the PCO2 went from 40 to zero, does not drop the bicarbonate by 17. So that's ruled out. So you're left with either a metabolic uh, acidosis or chronic respiratory alkalosis. Okay, well, we look for the anion gap because if there's an anion gap elevation, that's not going to be compatible with re chronic respiratory alkalosis is one of the clues. So the anion gap here is 19, I think it is. So it's up by about seven or eight. Remember, we add the change in the anion gap to the current bicarbonate to get the original. When we do that, we don't get 25. If we add um, seven or eight to eight, we get 16, 17. So we're still left with a low bicarbonate, which means that the patient not only likely has uh, an anion gap metabolic acidosis, but also has a non gap metabolic acidosis pattern, which you often see in the anion gap metabolic acidosis if the anion is excreted. If the anion is excreted in the urine, you can convert the whole thing to hyperchloremic. So, for instance, if you're in ketoacidosis and you get rid of all the ketone bodies in your urine, you're going to have a non anion gap metabolic acidosis. It's still due to the same ketone bodies with the ketone body and the proton coming into the blood. It's just your kidney got rid of all the organic anions. They're not gonna be in the blood to raise your anion gap and you're gonna be hyperchloremic. So the fact that the anion gap elevation doesn't exactly match the fallen bicarbonate is what we common see, commonly see as long as your kidney can get rid of uh, some of those uh, organic anions. It can get rid of all of them or it can get rid of some of them. So you can have mixed, mixed patterns. Uh, again, we look at the PCO2, and again, we predict it should fall by about 17, 18, 19. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a little bit more than uh, we would predict. This patient, this is a little complex because when we check the compensation, some people use the Winters formula as shown there. And if you do that, uh, you end up that it's compensated. Again, the non-anion gap pattern is there uh, in addition to the um, uh, anion gap uh, pattern. That won't, won't change. But if you use the rule one-to-one -one, that the fall in PCO2 should fall with the bicarbonate fail, then you end up with a respiratory alkalosis in addition because the PCO2 fell more than you would predict. So here's one of these examples where it really depends what you're using to assess the compensation. And that's why it's a bit confusing because it's not an exact science um, and depends which one you use, you're gonna get a different result. If you use the Winters formula, you're gonna say it's perfectly compensated. If you don't use the Winters formula and, and lose the one-to-one -one rule, you'll say the PCO2 fell more than you would predict. So unfortunately, this is the, you know, this is the life we live. Okay, well, the patient was treated with antibiotics. CAT scan uh, was normal. Uh, that was done. Five days later, she developed anuria requiring dialysis. 
uh, with some label hypertension, and she developed some neurologic changes, bilateral facial nerve palsy, bulbar symptoms, obtunded, requiring ventilation. MRI showed uh, brain edema with herniation and she died 24 hours later. Anyone have an idea what the clinical diagnosis was? Developing severe renal failure requiring dialysis with um, facial nerve abnormalities and bulbar symptoms. It's a, it's a clinical syndrome. Well, the patient said that uh, he had drank 150 mils of a clear fluid um, that ended up being 100% diethylene glycol. So diethylene glycol is a common industrial solvent with a sweet taste, and people drink it uh, instead of alcohol. It has a nice taste. And there's three phases. The first thing that happens, again, clinical syndrome, GI first, then renal, then CNS. You have to memorize that. It's metabolized uh, into hydroxyethoxyacetic acid and dicolic acid, which is why you get the organic uh, uh, anion metabolic acidosis. And these compounds are hypothesized to cause the, the renal and the brain abnormalities. Now, interestingly, it was first described in 1937, um, and, it's, and it's been called uh, the Massengill's elixir sulfonilamide incidence, where 100 people actually died. And it was the cause of why the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed. Uh, first written up in JAMA, you can read the article, it's an interesting history. Uh, but what happened was sulfonilamide was a drug used to treat streptococcal infections in the 30s, and it had dramatic effects for the first time people were cured, but it was given in tablet and powder form. And then in June of 1937, a salesman for this company, the SC Massengill Company in Bristol, Tennessee, reported a huge demand in the southern states for this drug being given in liquid form. So the company's chief chemist and pharmacist, Harold Cole Watkins, found that sulfonilamide would dissolve very nicely in diethylene glycol. And they tested the mixture for flavor, appearance, and fragrance and found it satisfactory. And they shipped out 633 of these bottles throughout the country. And as I say, 100 people died from it. So uh, that was really the first uh, cases of uh, diethylene glycol poisoning. Interesting history. Okay, next patient was an 86-year-old woman in the ER with shortness of breath, confusion, and ataxia, CKD, a peptic ulcer, intestinal obstruction, uh, gastrojejunostomy a year ago, and she was put on uh, bioferrin supplements. These are uh, supplements that contain lactobacillus acidophilus, plus mulberry juice, sugar, and honey. And on exam, she had a very fast respiratory rate with uh, increased blood pressure and distended intestinal abdominal loops. Her total CO2 was five, calculated by carbon at 3.9. And you can see her anion gap was uh, 20. So it's up by about eight or nine. And she had renal insufficiency, ketones and lactate negative. So again, the same sort of thinking, bicarbonate's low, metabolic acidosis, acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis, too low for acute respiratory alkalosis. Anion gap elevated suggests it's not chronic respiratory alkalosis, but we're dealing with a metabolic acidosis. But when we add the change in the anion gap of eight to the current bicarbonate, we don't get 25. We get a number less than that, right? We get 12, 13, roughly. Um, so we're dealing with an elevated anion gap type pattern, but also a hyperchloremic pattern. And again, we can see that if there are organic anions floating around and they're excreted, the pattern can change from something in between to totally hyperchloremic, depending on how well those organic anions are excreted. What about the PCO2? Well, again, using the one-to-one -one rule, the bicarbonate fell by about say 21, 22, 23, we don't know what the original was, but the PCO2 fell way more than that. So we're also dealing with a respiratory alkalosis. So again, we're dealing with an anion gap metabolic acidosis with a non-anion gap pattern also, 
and a respiratory alkalosis because the PCO2 is lower than we would predict just from the compensation. Patient was dialyzed uh, because of lack of response to bicarbonate. What's the clinical diagnosis? Anyone want to take a stab? So this patient's D-lactate was 6.8 and the diagnosis of D-lactic acidosis was made. Now, again, the D-lactate was not up by you know, 21, as one might expect, because of the drop in bicarbonate of down to four, because the D-lactate was excreted um, in, in the urine to some extent. And, and at every time it's excreted, a chloride goes up uh, equimolarly and you become hyperchloremic. So the anion gap, so the, the anion gap elevation uh, is whatever the D-lactate is, but it's still much less than you would predict for the fallen bicarbonate just because the lactate ended up in the urine and it becomes hyperchloremic. So the first case was reported in 79 by Mano in the New England Journal, and it was a male with short bowel syndrome. And since then, it's been known to occur in anyone with uh, abdominal surgeries, jejunal ileal bypass, small bowel resection, malabsorption. Uh, you get CNS changes, probably because of the D-lactate and the metabolic, uh, other metabolic products from the bacteria, and it's often associated with lactobacillus. So this woman was taking probiotics with lactobacillus, and that was why she filled up her colon with lactobacillus. Plus, she was taking all these carbohydrates that the lactobacillus loves and converts to D-lactate. Now, we have the ability to take some of this D-lactate uh, because we have this enzyme D2 hydroxy dehydrogenase, which can metabolize it to pyruvate. But if it can't keep up, then your D lactate level uh, will go up. So the treatment is just to withhold the carbohydrates. Uh, you treat the metabolic acidosis, give antibiotics to get rid of the lactobacillus, dialyze uh, as needed. This cartoon just shows um, a summary of what I mentioned. It's usually occurring in people with these intestinal bypass procedures um, and with lactobacillus as the major uh, organism that you typically always find either endogenously or exogenously because you're taking it in your probiotics. Uh, so there's an overgrowth. It's a gram-positive anaerobe and it makes uh, D-lactate in the presence of uh, uh, different carbohydrates. And as I say, there's this enzyme D2 hydroxy acid dehydrogenase near the top of the figure that converts the D-lactate to pyruvate, but it depends how fast that's occurring. And if it's not keeping up, you're gonna end up with an elevated D-lactate level in your blood with a proton that causes the metabolic acidosis. So D-lactic acidosis, don't forget it. Here's another patient, um, five-year-old female uh, with epilepsy, taxia, sensory neural deafness, speech and motor delay intention tremor and dystyatico kinesis. This is, that, that means someone who can't do rapid um, alternating movements like flipping your hand up and down or tapping your foot up and down, uh, impairment in that. And uh, blood pressure was uh, decreased. And the numbers showed an elevated total CO2, elevated bicarbonate, renin was high, calcium in the urine very low, calcium to creatinine ratio of 0.07, magnesium in the blood low and a high fractional excretion of magnesium in the urine. So bicarbonate elevated, it's either metabolic alkalosis or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. Um, and uh, with the hypokalemia, we're thinking more of metabolic alkalosis. And again, the high renin, the low calcium and the low magnesium give other clues, things you're not gonna see in respiratory acidosis. So we're thinking metabolic alkalosis. So we look at the bicarbonate it's so a female, probably started at 22, 23. So it's up by uh, probably seven or so. PCO2, remember, isn't 40 in a female. It's about 37, 38. So the PCO2 is up here roughly as expected. It's seven tenths of the change in bicarbonate. So the acid-base diagnosis is a compensated metabolic alkalosis. But what's the clinical diagnosis? Anybody uh, want to say? Water. Say again, sorry. Barter. So barter syndrome. Remains, Gittleman. Yeah. Gittleman, so, yeah. Oh, Gitt well, Gittleman, yeah. right. So if, if you're going to say anything, you would say Gittleman. Uh, and typically you would be right. 
but again, these are unusual cases, so I'm not showing you a Gittleman. Um, but yes, you would be right. The, the most common reason for these numbers is Gittleman syndrome. Uh, but this patient, it turns out, doesn't have Gittleman syndrome. So the clinical diagnosis here is called East or Sesame syndrome. It was first described in 2009. And you're going to need to know it because they could fool you on your exam. Um, it, uh, the East stands for epilepsy, ataxia, sensory neural deficit, and tubulopathy. Um, that's the acronym they gave it in this article. There was another article that came out at the same time describing it, and they had called it seizures, sensory neural deficit, ataxia, mental retardation, electrolyte imbalance, and that's where the sesame comes from. So remember, it's either called East or Sesame syndrome, and it looks exactly like Gittleman, but it's not. And here's what's going on. It's complicated. So it's occurring in the distal convoluted tubule, the same part of the nephron where Gittleman is, but you're going to have to memorize the transporters involved, it's a, and it's complicated. It ends up being that the sodium chloride cotransporter on the left there, the top left, NaCl, is inhibited. But it's not inhibited because of mutations. It's inhibited indirectly in this disease. That's why it looks like Gittleman's. It's exactly like being on thiazides. It's exactly like Gittleman's, but it, there's no problem with the sodium chloride cotransporter. It's inhibited because of the following. If you go to the right side, if you see that potassium going through that channel, that channel is called a KIR 4.1 potassium channel encoded by the KCN J10 uh, gene. And that's what's mutated in these patients. So what happens? When that channel is mutated, less potassium can come out of the cell. When less potassium comes out of the cell, for electrical reasons, less chloride above it can come out of, through the um, CLCKB Barton channel. That channel, by the way, is mutated in Bar Barter syndrome, but not in the, this patient. So less chloride can come out through that channel. And when that happens, the WNK4 enzyme does not work as well. It's, it chloride binds to that enzyme and inhibits it. So when the WNK4 enzyme, which is a phosphatase, doesn't work well, the SPAC protein also doesn't work well. And the SPAC protein is another phosphatase. It also is a phosphorylator. And it's the key phosphorylator of the sodium chloride cotransporter on the luminal membrane. Um, and it needs to be transported to work. So normally in all of us, it's being phosphorylated all the time by SPAC, and that's why it's working. And when it's not phosphorylated, it doesn't work. It's exactly as if you have Gittleman, but not because it's mutated. So what happens now is you don't get sufficient. It's exactly like being on thiazides that bind to it and inhibit it. But here, it's all because it's not being phosphorylated properly because of this chain of events, all starting with the potassium channel on the right side. So again, potassium doesn't come out, then chloride doesn't come out. Chloride doesn't come out, it goes too high in the cell. It binds to the, w, the WNK4 enzyme. WNK4 enzyme stops phosphorylating SPAC. SPAC then can't phosphorylate the sodium chloride cotransporter. Now too much sodium chloride gets delivered to the next part of the nephron, the cortovolecting duct, which is shown on the right side here, where you have three types of cells. You have a cell secreting protons, the alpha intergulated cell, a cell absorbing sodium in exchange for potassium, uh, and a cell where the pendrum that I talked about before secretes bicarbonate in exchange for chloride. Well, it turns out if there's too much sodium coming down to the cortovolecting duct, you end up with too much H secretion by the top cell that causes the metabolic alkalosis. And you end up with too much sodium absorption and K secretion, which causes the hypokalemia. Why these patients have low magnesium in the urine, if you go to that distal convoluted cell again, is because for some reason, when you block that K channel, you have less trip M6 and seven channels. The trip M6 at the bottom there on the left of the cell is where magnesium is trans. It's a magnesium channel that's key for magnesium transport uh, in this part of the nephron. And you just have less of those channels in the, in, the, in the membrane. And so magnesium can't be absorbed normally and you end up with hypomagnesemia. Why you end up with hypocalcemia 
is because the patients become volume depleted because of the excess sodium chloride loss uh, in, from the distal convoluted tubule that can't be made up by the cortical collecting duct principal cell. And so excess sodium comes into the urine, you get volume depleted. And because of that, the proximal tubule shown in gray in the middle and the bottom absorbs too much calcium. That's what's felt to occur. And now calcium is absorbed between the cells, um, um, either on, on, on the Clodin protein shown there between the cells, Clodin 10A possibly. Um, um, anyway, sodium, uh, Clodin, Clodin is, is, is what uh, is absorbing the calcium. And the hypothesis is that because of the volume depletion, there's too much calcium absorbed absorb proximally. And that's why you end up with very little calcium in the urine. It's the same hypothesis for wine gittleman syndrome. You, you have very little calcium in the urine. Again, your volume depleted and you have too much calcium absorbed in the proximal tubule. Um, so we talked about the magnesium being low because of less trip M6 uh, channels, mechanism unknown. We talked about why the K is low. You have excess K secretion via the principal cells in the cortical collecting duct due to stimulation of uh, ENEC sodium absorption uh, because you have excess sodium coming to this segment from the distal convoluted tubule where it's not absorbed normally. You have bicarbonate generated excessively by the top cell that's secreting too, too many protons uh, and calcium is low in the urine because of excess proximal tubule. Um, paracellular, paracellular means between the cells, calcium absorption. You can give a milleride, which will block uh, the ENAC channel in the second channel, labeled principal cell on the right side there. That will impair K secretion. It'll also help with some of the H secretion indirectly, so the bicarbonate will uh, return to more, more normal levels. But it won't do anything for the hypomagnesemia, uh, and it'll make the hypocalcemia potentially worse because you're gonna make the patient even more volume depleted. So it doesn't ameliorate everything in the syndrome, but the key is that when, you, when your brain says this is Gittleman's, don't just stop there. Ask yourself, is this East or Sesame syndrome? Because it, it could be in an exam. There's now a differential diagnosis for the pattern that looks exactly like um, Gittleman's syndrome. There are other diseases too, some of the Barter syndrome chloride channel Mutations can look like it too, but we won't get into that today. There's a there's a there's a differential diagnosis for patients that look like Gittleman's. That's that's in addition to obviously um, being on a thiazide diuretic. You have to remember the whole list because that could be on your exam. Okay, here's another patient, uh, 56 year old with a long-standing tracheostomy. NG tube was placed three months ago because of difficulty swallowing. Meds you see there, three-day history of hematemesis, melanoma, hiccups. Exam showed a respiratory rate that was increased, some gasping, hiccups. Patient was hiccuping all the time. Uh, and then endoscopy, some esophagitis and antral gastritis. And here are the numbers. Bicarbonate's low. Again, metabolic acidosis, acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis, PCO2 is low. Uh, and the question is, you know, what is it? Is it the metabolic or the respiratory alkalosis? Here we don't have electrolytes to look for anion gaps in the rest, so it's a bit harder. Uh, so I'll just show you the numbers work out to either acute plus chronic respiratory alkalosis um, or chronic respiratory alkalosis with a metabolic uh, alkalosis. Can't distinguish between the two. So the patient uh, had the NG tube removed and the hiccup stopped. Uh, and after the NG tube removal, two days later, the bicarbonate actually returned to normal. Anyone want to make a clinical diagnosis why this patient um, had the respiratory alkalosis? Well, it's actually due to the hiccups. Um, hiccups chronically um, or for a prolonged period of time acutely have been associated with a respiratory alkalosis. It was first described in 91. People don't think of it, um, but it's definitely a cause. And if you can stop the hiccups, the respiratory alkalosis goes away. Remember with respiratory alkalosis, we divide it up into acute versus chronic. So if we drop the PCO2 and just keep it at some level, the bicarbonate 
has this temporal change with time. It falls immediately, which we call acute. But if you keep following the bicarbonate, even though the PCO2 hasn't changed um, significantly and stays the same, the bicarbonate will continue to fall. Uh, and it reaches a new steady state after uh, four or five days or so. Uh, where it won't change anymore. And we call that chronic respiratory alkalosis. And if you come in between, you're going to get some number in between. It'll look like, you know, it's it's both. Um, or it'll, it, it's impossible to tell exactly what's going on. We, we only have a name for the beginning and then the end. But again, remember hiccups, especially chronic hiccups is associated with respiratory alkalosis. And it can look acute or chronic depending on how long it's been going on. Okay, here's another interesting case, a 62-year-old female um, with lower abdominal pain, difficulty voiding, uh, chronic bladder problems, confusion and vomiting, diabetic, hypertensive, recurrent urinary retention from the bladder abnormalities, unexamined, drowsy with uh, hypertension when she was lying, but sitting up, blood pressure fell significantly JVP was flat, and also she had a pulse that uh, went up significantly when she was sitting. So she looked, you know, volume depleted. So here's her numbers. Um, she came in hyponatremic, and her K was up. Her anion gap was very high. It was 41, as you see there, bicarbonate 17. Um, she had a pH of 7.33, PCO2 of 38. Uh, creatinine and BUN were modestly elevated, significantly hyperglycemic, 2016. The number on the left is in millimoles per liter, but in the units we typically use, it was 2016. And uh, her phosphate was elevated. Then 12 hours later, her anion gap had fallen. By 24 hours, it fell even further. But um, if you look at her bicarbonate, it really didn't do much. So that is shown better on this um, page here where the anion gap over the next day or so came nicely down, but the bicarbonate did not change very much. Now remember, um, and she was given uh, saline and, and insulin in the ER. Normally when the, when the anion gap falls and it's due to a metabolizable organic anion like lactate or beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, you generate bicarbonate. This just shows the reaction from lactate. When, when, when lactate's metabolized, it's a source of bicarbonate, just like citrate that we use, um, uh, or lactate, lactate that we use in TPN solutions, for example. We're, we're hoping that this reaction is occurring in the body. That's why we have lactate there. Um, TPN, you know, other organic anions. Um, but the same thing occurs with an organic acidosis. As it resolves, the organic anion is converted into bicarbonate. But here, the bicarbonate is staying the same. So what is going on? Well, they looked at the source of the anion gap. They looked at lactate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, phosphate, albumin, which contributes to the anion gap. And they came up with these contributing a little bit, but they're still missing 14 milliequivalents per liter of anions at the bottom. But by day, but by the 12th and the 24th hour, they weren't missing any, any, you know, but again, the anion gap had been falling by that time. But initially, you know, they were missing 14 milliequivalents per liter of anions. What, what anions were these? Um, well, the other thing they looked at was in the urine, is it possible that the anion gap was falling because the anions were coming out in the urine, as I told you about initially, whenever you have an anion gap, uh, elevation, um, the anions may not be metabolized into bicarbonate. They also may just be excreted in the urine. And if they do, you don't get metabolism into bicarbonate. You become hyperchloremic with the same low bicarbonate. Um, and so the question they asked was, well, were the anions coming into the urine? Well, they looked at the urine and, it, and they calculated what's called the net charge, looking at the positive and negative charges. And again, there's no negative charges in the urine. If there were anions coming out in the urine, there would have been a net negative charge. And it was like plus two, if anything, it was slightly positive. And then 
12 hours later, a little bit negative, 24 hours later, a little bit. So the bottom line here is they didn't find any plethora of negative charges in the urine to account for why the blood anion gap level was falling. It wasn't because the anions were coming out in the urine either. So they weren't metabolized into bicarbonate because the bicarbonate wasn't going up. They weren't being excreted in the urine. So how was the anion gap falling? So the anion gap uh, cannot be accounted for by measurable anions as we talked about, it's missing about 14. And the falling anion gap was not converted to bicarbonate and the anions were not, and bicarbonate was not coming out in the urine. So what is going on with this fall in the anion gap? Because normally we ask two questions, are they being converted into bicarbonate and the bicarbonate should be going up. Are they coming out in the urine? We should see them in the urine. And we did not. So what are the possible considerations in this case, which was first described in 96 that you have to be aware of um, at, that can account for what we're seeing? Well, it's possible the anion gap was composed of anions that were not measured by the lab, that there's some strange uh, anions floating around here that you know we didn't know about. Uh, and they were coming out in the urine and that's why um, the plasma bicarbonate was not going up because they weren't being converted in the blood into, into bicarbonate. It's also possible that the organion or the organic anions were non-metabolizable. For instance, if you take carbenicillin, an antibiotic we used to give, carbenicillin is not metabolized into bicarbonate, but it will raise your anion gap and it will be excreted in the urine. You should see it if the anion gap is falling, but you would never expect if the anion gap is falling for the bicarbonate to go up because it cannot be metabolized into bicarbonate. So some organic anions are what we call not, are non-metabolizable. So it's possible that's what these anions were, but again, what were they? Is it also possible the anions were shifting um, into a larger volume from the vascular space, either the extracellular fluid or into the cells in exchange for either a cation or excuse me, with a cation. So sodium organic anion going into the ECF or going into cells out of the blood vessels or in exchange for chloride organic anion going into the cells in exchange for chloride coming out. Is that possible, what was happening? What they, what they hypothesized in this paper was that it was due to the albumin. And the charge on albumin was actually uh, changing over time. That initially, um, the charge on albumin was higher than it normally was. And then over time, uh, it decreased. And they had some reasons to hypothesize that. But again, uh, it's a hypothesis. The, the teaching points from this case are that you should always expect when an anion gap falls um, for, you should always expect, sorry, it's my fault. Um, when um, the anion gap falls for the bicarbonate to go up. And if the anion gap uh, falls and it doesn't, that you're gonna find the uh, organic anions in the urine. When you don't see that, something's going on that really has to bother you. Um, and that's you know, what this case shows. So if in the future you see the anion gap falling and the bicarbonate's not going up and you can't find the anions in the urine, you have to think further. Don't just accept that. And so that's, this, this, this slide summarizes all the things you need to think about. So Dr. Kirsch, it's needle. Yeah. So what was that unmeasured anion in that diabetic person with a thousand yeah, of the, the, um, there was The anion was due to the charge on albumin. The albumin charge increased. The albumin <laughs> was create. Remember, albumin co contributes about a third to half of your normal anion gap. And so you can change the anion gap just by changing the charge on albumin. And so in this case, they hypothesized that the charge on albumin, and, and those charges... Are, are not constant. It depends how much sodium and protons are attached to albumin. That's why the pH can change the charge on albumin. It's dynamic, it's not fixed. And so- Was that improved as soon as they uh, basically right. managed glycemic match? Right, they, I mean, but again, there were no ketones there. So the ketones couldn't account- Yeah, but what I'm referring, so they are yeah. not measuring something that this patients might have and they are not measuring- Well, they, they, had, they hypothesized they were measuring everything and it was all due to albumin. 
there was or there, maybe they there's something that they they don't know about it yes. the machine is not measured yeah that's the defect with the article that you know their hypothesis yeah. was that the patient because the thousands of glucose is not that common but but right. it's very interesting case thank yeah. you i mean they were hypothesizing that there it was not due to an ingestion of something and there were no that the patient was a great historian there was no toxicity with other compounds that might raise the anion gap and so they they felt they had measured everything endogenously that could be going on like lactate and the ketone bodies and they were left hypothesizing that it's not some magic organic anion that they didn't know about that it must be a, the charge on albumin became very negative initially and that with therapy the charge on albumin went, went back to what it normally is and that's why the anion gap fell so it's a very weird case but the nice thing about it is it makes you go through all the thinking um, uh, when you have a patient where the, where the anion gap falls and the bicarbonate is not going up like it should. They should mirror each other in a typical patient. Right. Okay. Thank you. This is another case, 83-year-old female, four-day history of chest pain, worsening shortness of breath, weight gain and edema, a CKD G3A3 some protein in the urine, hypertension, and NSAID use, chronic hyperkalemia, complicated patient, osteoporosis with GERD, um, JVP was elevated, some crackles, chest was tender, and leg edema. And uh, the chest x-ray, there were some effusions, some broken ribs. Uh, and the key points are that the patient was treated with uh, a number of things, including calcium carbonate and mag oxide and sodium polystyrene. Those are the um, interesting things as far as what we're concerned with today. On admission, uh, the patient uh, had some renal insufficiency, uh, K up a little bit, um, not much going on with the total CO2, but uh, sorry, five months prior to admission. But on admission, the total CO2 was 46. Uh, and um, the K was two, uh, pH 7.55, PCO2 52, bicarbonate 44. So again, elevated bicarbonate, you're either dealing with a metabolic alkalosis or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. Uh, and in this case, it's a metabolic alkalosis. The PCO2 is lower than you would predict as a compensation. So the patient also has metabolic alkalosis. Again, the K is a clue. You're not going to get hypokalemia from a re chronic respiratory acidosis. So you know when you see that, you're likely dealing with metabolic alkalosis. So metabolic alkalosis with ventilation that's more than you predict. So what is the cause of the metabolic alkalosis? Uh, this is described nicely in an article in 2017 in the AGKD. It's a little complicated, but the metabolic alkalosis came from the mag oxide and the calcium carbonate. So normally, and the sodium polystyrene, um, so that caused the hypokalemia. Normally, without the resin, when you give mag uh, oxide or mag hydroxide, when it hits the stomach, it's converted into mag chloride because of the HCl secretion. And then when it hits the duodenum, it's converted to mag carbonate because of the bicarbonate secretion. And you end up with nothing because the mag carbonate isn't well absorbed. And the amount of protons secreted in the stomach is exactly matched by the bicarbonate secreted by the duodenum. So in a net sense, nothing happens. You just generate carbon dioxide, which your lungs get rid of, and mag carbonate, which comes out in your stool. However, the key is that if you have sodium polystyrene, uh, in addition, what happens in the stomach is you create the mag chloride like before, but in the duodenum, when bicarbonate is secreted, the magnesium can actually attach to the resin and you end up generating bicarbonate. Instead of uh, mag carbonate, you end up generating net sodium bicarbonate and the sodium bicarbonate is easily absorbed. And so that's one source of where the bicarbonate came from as far as generating the metabolic alkalosis. So, so it's key to know whether someone's taking this resin in addition to the mag oxide. In addition to the fact that the CKD prevents the bicarbonate from coming out. So again, remember in the maintenance phase, your GFR is very important as to whether you can get rid of the bicarbonate. If you're volume depleted or you have CKD, 
for a given bicarbonate input into the system, you're going to elevate the bicarbonate much more than if your GFR is normal. So you always has, have to assess the GFR either on a reversible basis from volume depletion or CKD as to whether someone's going to have the propensity for developing a metabolic alkalosis with a bicarbonate load. The same thinking with the calcium carbonate. If you just have calcium carbonate, the calcium gets tur turned into calcium chloride in the stomach. And then in the duodenum, it gets converted to calcium carbonate, which is not uh, absorbable. Plus, um, it doesn't dissolve well calcium carbonate. It stays as that salt. Um, its solubility is pretty low. There's a very high affinity of calcium for carbonate in, in an aqueous solution. However, if you have the resin, the stomach is again the same. You make the calcium chloride, but in the duodenum, the calcium can also bind to the resin, and it turns out that you generate, now you have the sodium bicarbonate coming out free from the duodenum, and that can get absorbed. So this patient was put on the resin uh, and also two sources of what could go wrong, the uh, calcium carbonate and also uh, the mag oxide. And that's, that was the source of the generation of the metabolic uh, alkalosis. Now, what's the role of hypokalemia in metabolic alkalosis? It's always asked. Um, and this isn't true just of this patient, but other patients. First of all, there's HK exchange mechanisms that cause H to enter cells. And that generates bicarbonate, which then stays in your extracellular fluid. That's one uh, effect. And the other is that hypokalemia increases proximal tubule ammonia production. And that reaction, remember, occurs with bicarbonate production from alpha ketoglutarate. Whenever you make ammonia in the proximal tubule, you're also generating alpha ketoglutarate, which can, can, is converted um, in the proximal tubule cells to two bicarbonate ions. So the hypokalemia, like metabolic alkalosis, acidosis stimulates proximal tubule ammonia production. Why it does, no one still understands but those two things stimulate ammonia production. That's why we have more ammonia in the urine in diarrhea and in patients who are hypokalemic. It's because the proximal tubule is making more ammonia than it normally does, but it's also making more bicarbonate. And lastly, hypokalemia stimulates proximal tubule and collecting duct proton secretion and therefore bicarbonate reclamation. So there's hypokalemia has all these effects which tend to raise your bicarbonate. So how should this patient's disorder be treated, stop the resin. Usually stopping the resin is sufficient. Uh, and if you're gonna give the resin, don't give the resin at the same time you're giving the calcium carbonate and the mag oxide like this patient. Separate them in time and then you'll be fine. And I think we'll stop there. A little over, I apologize for that. Uh, so just some interesting acid-base cases clinically. Um, and some complexities as far as the acid-base diagnosis. On your board exam, uh, they could give you some of these, especially the Tylenol thing is something uh, they love to, to have on the boards. Uh, and some of these other things like D, uh, D lactate you need to know about. Um, and that's it. Does anyone have any questions? If not, I'd be glad to go over anything anyone's confused about offline or uh, by email. Anyone have any questions? Okay, then I think we'll stop there and thanks for listening.